thoughts are like waves and you can choose to be drowned by them on the surface or to go deep in the bottom and just observe them. If you want to understand your mind, you should see it and observe it. That's the teaching of a Zen master of the 20th century in Bodh Gaya, the place where the Buddha got enlightened. Meditation has been a practice that has got a lot of popularity in the West because of its potential benefits to improve focus and decrease emotional reactivity and create awareness of mental patterns. And today I want to break down what I've been able to grasp from this practice. And for that, I'll need to give you a little bit of background of the Buddhist doctrine. There was a young prince in some Himalayan kingdom around the year 500 BC. And the tales narrate that this prince, which was about to become the central figure in the Buddhist doctrine, Siddhartha Gautama, understood that suffering was filtered through the mind. And he could see that people suffer not only from death, illness, starvation, but also from frustration and dissatisfaction. According to Buddhism, the root of suffering is not pain or sadness or the lack of meaning. Rather, the real root of suffering is a never-ending and pointless pursuit of ephemeral feelings that keeps the mind in a state of restlessness and consistent disappointment. Even when experiencing pleasurable experiences, the mind always has that fear of losing it or it might get adapted to it and it might want it to intensify because it's not enough. So the doctrine says that the antidote itself to that suffering is to see it with what is pleasant or what is unpleasant and watch it as it is. If you are sad and you don't have the need to repel the sadness, then there's no more resistance and therefore, although you will continue being sad, you won't suffer from it anymore. Gautama developed a set of practices, of meditation practices that focus your attention around the question of what am I experiencing, rather than what would I like to experience. I'll give you some of the core principles in which the practice is foundated. Number one, suffering from craving, coming from the expectation of things that we want and things that we don't want. On one side, we are incredible machines to design our own environment and that help us to put our preferences up and grasp what is pleasant and repel what is unpleasant. But the thing is that there will be things always out of our control that pushes us to either be content with it or live in consistent frustration. And from the Buddhist perspective, it's hard to cure a disease when the medicine itself is the one that is causing it. It's like an itch that you are scratching and the scratching only makes it worse. When we try, for example, to quench our thirst and we drink salty water, we just make ourselves thirstier. That's what happens when we get into the illusion that the only way to feel pleasant sensations is by fulfilling desires. The second principle is a principle of impermanence, that everything that ends is the beginning of something new. It's hard for us, although we see it all the time, to understand that there's a natural cycle of growth, decay, and finally death, and that everything changes. It is the same attachment that we have to material objects, experiences, people, and even to the fact of being alive that generates a lot of our own suffering. And finally, the third component is egolessness. It's the clear and unedited scene of reality. And it's interesting that from a neuroscience and evolutionary psychology standpoint, it makes sense that we were not designed to see reality as it is, to perceive it as it is. In the description section, I will put three links that will give you an insight of why it is that we are not designed to see reality as it is. When we see out through the window and we want to get and perceive what is out there, the reality itself, many of us get trapped in our own reflection in the mirror and over time that becomes second nature and it's a good analogy to see how everything that we perceive end up being filtering at first by our notion of self and when there's a notion of self there's a need to gratify it and to defend it right we get attached to certain kind of identities and that can be a set of beliefs a set of habits a set of physical looks. And the issue is that we end up 
making up narratives of who we are and who we should be uh, in order to pull ourselves from reality. We fail to see a consistent constellation of changing elements. Like a movie, in the end, what you are actually seeing is frames that are passing so close, so quickly that you're not able to see the spaces in between. Another great example of our of how flawed is our notion of identity is proven by the rubber hand experiment, where so much of our perception of who we are is targeted to visual cues. So let me get into the practice itself. There are three basic different layers of how you can approach meditation practice. A mindfulness stage, a stage of vipassana or insight meditation, and finally a stage of metta and loving kindness. To start with, mindfulness is pointing to be one with experience. It's about sitting and cutting off any kind of input to just observe what's happening in your mind. It's like going to a cinema and watching the empty screen. Sooner or later, thoughts will arrive and you won't choose them. You will not be able to decide not to do it because our own nature, when you are untrained, is that you will get lost in thought, lost in emotions, lost and distracted by external cues. The biggest misunderstanding of the practice is that you should avoid thinking. And the Dharma, the doctrine, says very clearly that it's more about changing the relationship to what arises. In the end, the practice is not so much about changing your state and changing what's happening in your life, but rather noticing what it is to be only a spectrum of awareness. And furthermore, meditation is not about reflecting, but rather about silent observation, where new insights will emerge. Here are some general guidelines for you. Choose a trigger where you can focus your attention. Usually the breath is a good starting point. If you have a hard time understanding what I'm trying to say when you don't have the control over your thoughts, you should try to do 10 breaths, deep breath, and try not let your mind wander. Try going through the 10 breath, completely immersed in that experience. For the people who aren't trained, you'll find this extremely hard. Once you get real good at focusing on the breath, go for local awareness. So focus in different parts of your body from the inside. Not so much thinking that whatever notion of self is in your head. Focus on sensations, textures, pressure, temperature, the feeling of sitting, the gravity pulling you down. You can try doing panoramic versus center view. And finally, if you become really good with all of those, you can try sitting in complete stillness where a lot of unpleasant sensations will arise. Now, the practice itself is not about reaching a state of complete awareness because that will take years of practice. The, the essence of the practice itself is having the ability to catch yourself every time you, dis you are distracted and bringing yourself back to that center of awareness without any judgment. The point is, are you related to the experience by thinking and analyzing, or are you relating to the experiences by observing and feeling? The second level of meditation is what is known as vipassana or insight meditation. And vipassana means a clear scene of reality. And what you want to do is play with personal situations and manufacture thoughts to see how they change the states of your body and your emotions. You want to start anytime you feel you're out of control of some negative emotion, you might want to try to articulate emotion and try to trigger and feel what are the physiological responses to that emotion. Heart beating, acceleration in the breath, sweating the hands. The second step is about honoring the emotion and releasing the resistance. Number three is the mindful practice of deciding to either let it go or cultivate whatever you are feeling and whatever is arising in consciousness. As you learn to be mindful and learn to break the story you tell yourself about yourself, you realize that many of the negative emotions and mental patterns have a very short lifetime because those are states that need to be consistently fed by thought. And the more you see it, the more you practice, the more you will have a space of refraining, as a gap between an external stimulus and your instinctive reaction. The gap between those two will expand, and therefore it would allow you to take a decision in how you want to react. Finally, you can practice meta, 
also known as loving kindness. Buddhism argues that you can be mindful without being compassionate, but you cannot be compassionate without being mindful. And in the end, it's not only about creating the awareness of what's going in your mind, but it's also having the right concentration and the ability to cultivate skillful states of mind. Skillful states of mind are related to loving kindness, compassion, empathy, and sympathetic joy a space to exercise perspective and gratitude. My invitation is that you should not underestimate what 10 minutes of practice can do every single day. For me, the biggest lesson I've learned is that there's a critical balance between effort and surrendering. You don't want necessarily, in my perspective, to meditate so much that you will become a vegetable or a tree, where you stop being useful for the, those who you love and you stop serving in the society as it is. However, you don't want to be the person who's constantly in the chase of trying to change the things you cannot change and trying to find that missing piece that will give you complete fulfillment. I invite you to check the description below where you will find many resources that have been able to teach me many of the things I've learned in these past couple of years. If you love this video, let me know in the comment section below. Give me a thumbs up and we'll see you in another episode. Good luck.